Hello everybody, this is Caleb Daigle, and today I'm going to be reading Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which came out in 1975 by Graham Chapman, John Cleese, and Eric Idle, and Terry Gilman, and Terry Jones, and Michael Palin. The, the final draft of this screenplay, though, was released in 1974. This is for educational purposes only. I was told to read this bit before reading the screenplay. This is the official, unofficial, Monty Python and the Holy Grail screenplay. This file contains the script as it was on March 20th, 1974, before filming took place. There are many minor differences from what appears here and what ended up on the screen. This file also contains cut scenes and lines from the film. I try to preserve as much of the screenplay as possible, but it isn't easy to cross, cross out a section and pencil in new dialogue. In ACS2, any scene or dialogue that was crossed out begins with a quotation marks before it. Any scene or dialogue or uh, anything penciled in has another pair of quotation marks around it. I also put cut information before penciled in. What is interesting about a screenplay is to see what they threw out and what catchphrases uh, were literally penciled in. The reason I keyed in this file was caused by me downloading current transcripts going around the internet. It was an amazing job. I wouldn't want to have attempted what he did, but it wasn't in a good script format, and I didn't like how to... Uh, how the direction was written in. Since I had the real screenplay, I thought, what the hell? After this, I plan to key in Monty Python's second film. It is the first draft of the Holy Grail. It is the script that eventually got cannibalized in the sketches for the fourth season of Python. It is still quite different and well worth a read. Is anybody interested in it? Oh yes, I will stress this fact one more. This is a screenplay. So don't yell at me, the line is paraphrased in the film. This is what was written before filming took place, and it is still quite accurate. Enough of this. From Gru, in August of 1992. Um, and there's a PS, ranting about Connie Booth, Carol Cleveland. I don't know who those are. Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Reel 1, 1A, page 1. 00.01 .01 is the first action frame, which is 391.00 before the first clear cut, which is scene 4. 1. Faded. Starts at 00.01. .01. Titles on blank B.G. Python, Monty, Pictures, LTD. In association with Michael White presents. Fade out, fade in. Music starts. Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And then Monty Python eked in Holy Grail. Fade out, fade in. Written and performed by Graham Chapman, John Cleese, Eric Idle, Terry Gilman, Terry Jones, Michael Palin. Then Rotin Nick Askindy. Fade out, fade in. With Connie Booth, Carol Cleveland, Neil Lines, B. Duffel, John Young, Rita Daves. Then Wick. Tell out. Lynn. Also appearing, April Stewart, Sally Kinghorn. Then, also weak. Fade out, fade in. Also, also appearing, Mark Zykun, Elspeth Cameron, Mitsuko Forstarter, Sally Johnson, Sandy Rose, Romilly Squai, Joni Flynn, Allison Walker, Lorraine Ward, Anna Lansky, Sally Coombe, Vivine McDonald, Yvonne Dick, Daphne Darling, Fiona Gordon, Gloria Graham, Judy Lambs, Tracy Snedden, Sylvia Taylor, Joyce Palmer, and Mary Allen. Then, also, also week. Title out, title in. Camera operator, Howard Athern. Camera focus, John Willard. Camera assistant, Roger Pratt. Camera grip, Ray Hall. Charge hand electrician, Terry Hunt. Lighting, Telefilm Lighting Service, LTD. Andrew Ritchie and Son, LTD. Technicolor. Rostrom cameraman, Kent Houston. Then, we not try a holiday in Sweden this year. Title out, title in. Sound recordist, Garth Marshall. Sound mixer, Hugh Strain. Boom swinger, Godfrey Kirby. Sound maintenance, Philip Chubb. Sound assistant, Robert Doyle. Dubbing editor, John Foster. Assistant editors, John Mister, Nick Gaster. Alexander Campbell. Askew, Brian Preachy. Uh, Daniel Cavacci. Sound effects, Ian Crawford. Then, see the lovely lakes. Title out, title in. Continuity, Penny Isles. 
Accountant, Brian Brockwell. Production Secretary, Christine Wonk. Property Buyer, Brian Winterborn. Property Master, Tom Rayburn. Property Men, Roy Cannon and Charlotte Tobet. And Mike Kennedy. Catering, Ron Hellard, LTD. Vehicles, Budget, Rent-A-Car. Then, the wonderful telephone system. Title out, title in. Assistant Art Director, Philip Carlin. Construction Manager, Bill Harmon. Carpenters, Nobby Clark and Rob Delvin. Painter, Graham Bullock. Stagehand, Jim N. Savory. Rigger, Ed Sullivan. Then, and many interesting furry animals. Title out, title in. With special extra thanks to Charlie Knode, Brian McNully, John Glendhill, Peter Thompson, Sue Cable, Valerie Charlton, Drew Mara, Sue Smith, Charlie Coulter, Ian McMonaghan, Steve Bendel, Bernard Bellinger, Alpine McAlpine, Hugh Boyle, Dave Taylor, Gary Cooper, Peter Saunders, Les Shepard, Vaughn Millard, Momish McInnes, Terry Mosaic, and Bon O'Bjorn Renla. Made entirely on location in Scotland at Dune Castle, Castle Stalker, Killen, Glencoe, Arnold Castle, Brockham Falls, and Shrothmere. By Python Monty Pictures LTD 20 Fitzroy Square, London W1 England. And completed at Twickenham Film Studios England. Copyright 1974 National Film Trustee Company LT. All rights reserved. Then, the producers would like to thank the Ford Free Commission, Dune Emissions LTD, here in Cawdor Estates, Sterling University, and the people of Dune for their help in the making of this film. The characters in this sense are created, and the names used are fictitious, and any similarity to the names, characters, or history of any person is entirely accidental and unintentional. Signed, Richard M. Nixon. Including the Majestic Moose. Title in, title out. Songs, Neil Annis. Additional music, De Wolf. Then, a moose once beat my sister. Title in, title out. Costume designer, Hazel Pething. Then, no, really. She was carving her initials on the moose with a sharpened end of an interspace toothbrush given by Svenge, her brother in law, an Ostal dentist, and star in many Norwegian movies. The hot hands of an Ostal dentist, feelings of passion, and the huge molars of Horst Nordfink. Title out, title in. We apologize for the faults in subtitles. Those responsible have been sacked. Then, mind you, moose bites can be pretty nasty. Title out, title in. We apologize again for the fault in the subtitles. Those responsible for sacking the people who have just been sacked have been sacked. Fade out, fade in. Production manager, Julianne Doyle. Assistant director, Gary Harrison. Special effects, John Horton. Choreography, f flight director, or fight director and period consultant, John Walker. Makeup artist, Pearl Rashbass and Pam Luke. Photography, Julianne Doyle. Animation assistant, Lucianne Cowell. Kate Hepburn. Moose trained by Toot Hermskervorden Brothborda. Dissolve to Lighting Cameraman Terry Bedford. Special Moose Effects Olaf Prop. Moose Costumes Siggy Churchill. Sorry. Dissolve to Designer Roy Smith. Moose choreographed by Horst Prop the Third. Miss Taylor Taylor's Mooses by Hanks Dulsk Home, Moose trained to mix concrete and sign compl complicated insurance forms by Jurgen Wig. Dissolved to Editor John Hackney, Moose's nose wiped by Bjorn Erkstorm Slaughter Walker. Large Moose on the left half side of the screen in the third scene from the end given a thorough grounding in Latin, French, and zero level geography by Bo Ben. Suggested poses for the Moose suggested by Vic Rotter. Antler Care by Liv Thatcher. Title out, title in. The directors of the firm hired to continue the credits after the other people have been sacked, with it to be known that they have just been sacked. The credits have been completed in an entirely different style at great expense and at the last minute. Fade out, title on Yellow BG, executive producer John Goldstein and Ralph the Wonder Llama. Title out, title in. Producer Mark, Mark Forstotter, assisted by Earl J. Llama. Mike Q. Lama III, Cy Lama, and Merle Z. Lama. The, that's a Roman numeral. I'm kind of dumb. Title out, title in. Directed by 40 specially trained Ecuadorian mountain llamas, 6 Venezuelan red llamas, 142 Mexican whooping llamas, 14 North Chilean guanacos, closely related to the llama, Reg Llama of Brixton, 76,000 battery llamas from Llama Fresh Farms LTD near Paraguay and Terry Gillum and Terry Jones. 
fade out. One exterior castle walls day. Mist. Several seconds of it swirling about. Silence. Possibly atmospheric music. Superimpose England AD 787. After a few more seconds, we hear hoofbeats in the distance. They come close. They come slowly closer, then out of the mist comes King Arthur, followed by a servant, who is banging two half-coconuts together. Arthur raises his hand. Whoa, there! Servant makes noise of ho horses halting with a flourish. Arthur appears through the mist, cuts a shot from over his shoulder. Castle, e.g. Bodium, rising out of the mist. On the castle battlements, a soldier is dimly seen. He peers down. Halt! Who goes there? It is I, Arthur, son of Arthur Penadragon, from the castle of Camelot, king of all Britons, defeater of the Saxons, sovereign of all of England. Pause. Get away! I am, and this is my trusty servant, Patsy. We have ridden the length and breadth of the land in search of the knights who will join our court at Camelot. I must speak with your lord and master. What? Ridden on a horse? Yes. You're using coconuts. What? You've got two empty halves of coconuts and you're bringing them together. So, we have ridden since the snows of winter covered this land through the link through the kingdom of Mercia. Where did you get the coconuts? Through we found them. Found them at Mercia, the coconuts tropical. What do you mean? Well, this is a temperate zone. The swallow may fly south of the sun, or the house martin and the plover seek warmer hot lands in winter. Yet these are not strangers to our lands. Are you suggesting coconuts migrate? Not at all. They could be carried. What? A swallow carrying a coconut? Why not? I'll tell you why not, because a swallow is about eight inches long and weighs five ounces, and you'd be lucky to find a coconut under a pound. It could grip it by the husk. It's not a question of where he grips it, it's a simple matter of weight ratios. A five ounce bird could not hold a one pound coconut. Well, it doesn't matter. Go and tell your master that Arthur from the King of Cam from the Court of Camelot is here. A slight pause. Swirling mist. Silence. Look. To maintain velocity, a swallow needs to beat its wing 493 times every second. Right? Please! Am I right? I'm not interested. The second soldier, who has loomed up on the battlements. It could be an African swallow. Oh, yes! An African swallow, maybe. But not a European swallow. That's my point. Oh, yes. I agree there. Will you just ask your master if he wants to join the Knights of Camelot? But then, of course... Mm, mm. But then, of course, African swallows are not migratory. Oh, yes. Arthur raises his eyes heavenwards and nods to pastry. They turn and go off into the mist. So they wouldn't be able to bring a coconut back anyway. Wait a minute. Suppose two swallows carried it together. No, they'd have to have it on a line. Stillness. Silence again. Whew. Two animation slash live action sequence, death and devastation. Cut to Terry Gillum's sequence of Brookhill Prince. Sounds of strange medieval music, discordant and sparse. Wailings and groanings. The last picture mixes into live action. Big close-up of contorted faces upside down. A leg falls across it, creaking noise. The bodies lurch away from camera to reveal they are amongst a huge pile of bodies on a swaying cart that is lumbering away from camera. It is pulled by a couple of ragged, dirty, emaciated wretches. Behind the cart walks another man, who is slightly more prosperous, but only on the scale of complete and utter impoverishment. He wears a black hood and looks sinister. Bring it, you dead! We follow the cart through a wretched, impoverished, plague-written village. A few starved mongrels run about in the mud scavenging, and the open doorway of one house, perhaps, we judge... We just glimpse a pair of legs dangling from the ceiling. In another doorway, an old woman is beating a cat against a wall, rather like one does with a mat. The cart passes around the dead donkey cow in the mud, and the man tied to the cart, to a cart, is being hammered to death by four nuns with huge mallets. Bling out, you did! There are legs sticking out of windows and doors. Two men are fighting in the mud, covered from head to foot in it. Another man is on his hands and knees, shoveling mud into his mouth. We just catch sight of a man falling into a well. 
Bling out, you dead. Ears wound. Nine pence. I'm not dead. What? Nothing. There's your nine pence. I'm not dead. Here, he says it's not dead. Yes, he is. I'm not. He isn't. He will be soon. He's very ill. I'm getting better. You're not. You'll be stone dead in a few minutes. I can't take him like this. He's against the regulations. I don't want to go in the cart. Don't be such a baby. I can't take him. I feel fine. Do me a favor. I can't. Well, can you hang around a couple of minutes? He won't be long. I promise to beat the Robinsons. They've lost nine today. When's your next round? Thursday. I think I'll go for a walk. You're not fooling anyone, you know. To the car driver, he says. Isn't there anything you could do? Singing unrecognizably. I feel happy. I feel happy. The cart driver looks at the large man for a moment. Then they both do a quick, furtive look up and down the street. The cart driver very swiftly brings up a club and hits the old man. Out of shot, but the singing stops after a long, loud bonk noise. Handing over the money at last, the large man says, Thanks very much. That's all right. See you on Thursday. They turn. Suddenly, all of the village falls to their knees, touching forelocks, etc. Sorry. Arthur and Patsy ride in the shot. Slightly nose to the air, they ride through without acknowledging anybody. After they pass, the large man turns to the cart driver. Who's that, then? I don't know. Must be a king. Why? He hasn't got shite all over him. Three exterior day. Arthur and Patsy are riding. They stop and look. We see a castle in the distance before it a peasant is working away on his knees, trying to dig up the earth with his bare hands and a twig. Arthur and Patsy ride up and stop before the peasant. Old woman! Man! Man, I'm sorry. Old man. What knight lives in that castle over there? I'm 37! What? I'm 37! I'm not old! Well, I, I can't just say, hey man! Well, you could say, Dennis. I didn't know you were called Dennis. You didn't bother to find out, did you? I've said I'm... <clears throat> I've said I'm sorry about the old woman, but from the behind you looked... What I object to is that you automatically treat me like an inferior. Well, I am king. Oh, very nice king, eh? I expect you've got a palace and fine clothes and courtiers and plenty of food. How'd you get that? By exploiting the workers, by hanging on to outdated imperialist dogma, which perpetrates the social and economic differences in our society. If there's ever going to be any progress, an old woman appears. Dennis, there's some lovely filth down here. Oh, how do you do? How do you do, good lady? I am Arthur, King of the Britons. Can you tell me who lives in that castle? King of the who? <coughs> Sorry. The Britons. Who are the Britons? All of us. We are the Britons. Dennis winks at the old woman. And I am your king. Ooh, I didn't know we had a king. I thought we were an autonomous collective. You're fooling yourself. We're living in a dictatorship. A self-perpetuating autocracy which the working classes... There you are, bringing class into it again. That's what it's all about. If only... Please, please, good people, I am in haste. What knight lives in that castle? No one lives there. Well, who is your lord? We don't have a lord. What? I told you, we're an anarcho-syndicalist commune. We take it in turns to act as a sort of executive officer for the week. Yes. But on the decisions of that officer? Yes, I see. Must be approved in a bi-weekly meeting by a simple majority in the case of purely internal affairs. Be quiet! By a two-thirds majority, be quiet! I order you to shut up! 
order, eh? Who does he think he is? I am your king. Well, I didn't vote for you. You don't vote for kings. Well, how do you become king, then? The Lady of the Lake, her arm clad in the purest shimmering samite, held Excalibur aloft from the bosom of the water to signify by divine providence that I, Arthur, was to carry Excalibur. That is why I'm your king. Is Frank in? He'd be able to deal with this one. Look, strange women lying on their backs and pawns handing out swords. That's no basis for a system of government. Supreme executive power derives from a mandate from the masses, not from some farcial aquatic ceremony. Be quiet! You can't expect to wield supreme executive power just because some watery tart threw a sword at you. Shut up! I mean, if I went around saying I was an emperor because some moistened vintage lobster summit army, people would put me away. Grabbing him by the collar. Shut up! Shut up, will you? Ah, now we see the violence inherent in the system. Shut up! People, i.e. other peasants, are appearing and watching. Calling, Dennis says, Come and see the violence inherent in the system. Help! Help! I'm being repressed. Arthur, aware that people are now coming out and watching, Bloody peasant! Pushes Denison over into mud and prepares to ride off. Oh, did you hear that? What a giveaway! Come on, pasty. Patsy, pasty, whatever. They ride off. In the background, as they pull out, Did you see him repressing me then? That's what I've been on about! Ooh, this is tough. Four exterior forest day. Mixed through the Arthur and Patsy riding through the forest. They pass rune stones. We track with them. Close-ups of their face as they ride. Mixed to another tracking shot of them riding through the forest. They come to a clearing and stop. Looking ahead intently, their eyes light up. Sound effects of fight. Cut to their eye line. A clearing on the other side of which is a rough wooden footbridge across a stream. At the start of the bridge, a tremendous fight is going on. A huge black knight in black armor, his face totally masked in a visor, is fighting a slightly smaller knight in green armor. Perhaps, perhaps the green knight's armor is identical to the black knight's, save for the color. Cut back to Arthur and Patsy. They watch, growing more impressed as they, cut the, as they watch the fight. Cut back to the fight. The green knight lunges at the black knight, who avoids the blow with a skillful sidestep and parry, knocking the sword out of the green knight's hands. Cut back to Arthur and Patsy, even more impressed. Come back to the fight, the Green Knight has drawn out a particularly nasty mace, or spiked ball and chain, much longer than the Black Knight's sword. Arthur narrows his eyes, wondering whether the Black Knight will survive. Come back to the fight, the Green Knight swings at the Black Knight, who ducks under the first swing, leaves under the second, and starts to close on the Green Knight. Cut back to Arthur and Patsy, watching like a tennis match, sound effects of the fight reaching a climax, four almighty clangs, then silence. Cut back to see the Green Knight stretched out. The Black Knight sheaves his sword. Arthur looks at Patsy, nods, and they move forward. Cut back to the Black Knight picking up the Green Knight above his head and hurling him into the river. Arthur and Patsy approach him. You fight with the strength of many men, Sir Knight. Who dares to challenge the Black Knight? Actually, no, the Black Knight. Oh, I forget his voice. Who dares challenge the Black Knight? I do not challenge you. The Black Knight stares impassively and says nothing. I am Arthur, King of the Britons. Hint of a pause as he awaits for a reaction, which doesn't come. Arthur is only slightly thrown. I seek the bravest and the finest knights in all. The world to join me in my court at Camelot. The Black Knight remains silent. You have proved yourself worthy. Will you join me? Silence. A man of your knights and skill would be the chief of all my knights. Never. You make me sad, but so be it. Come, Patsy. As he moves, the black knight bars the way. None shall pass. What? None shall pass. I have no quarrel with you, brave sir knight, but I must cross this bridge. Then you shall die. I command you, as King of the Britons, to stand aside. I move for no man. So be it. 
Arthur draws his sword and approaches the Black Knight. A furious fight now starts lasting about 15 seconds, at which point Arthur delivers a mighty blow, which completely severs the Black Knight's left arm at the shoulder. Arthur steps back triumphantly. Now stand aside, worthy adversary. The Black Knight, glancing at his shoulder, says, "'Tis but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off! No, it isn't. Arthur, pointing to the arm on the ground. Well, what's that then? I've had worse. You're a liar! Come on, you pansy! Another ten seconds of furious fighting till Arthur chops the Black Knight's other arm off, also at the shoulder. The arm plus sword lies on the ground. Victory is mine! Sinking to his knees, he prays. I thank thee, O Lord, that in thy... Come on, then. What? He kicks Arthur hard on the side of the helmet. Arthur gets up, still holding his sword. The Black Knight comes after him, kicking. You are indeed brave, Sir Knight, but the fight is mine. Have enough? You stupid bastard, you haven't got any arms left. Of course I have. Look! What? Just a flesh wound. And he kicks Arthur. Stop that. Continuing to kick him, he says, Had enough? I'll have your leg. He is kicked. Right. The Black Knight kicks him again, and Arthur chops his leg off. The Black Knight keeps his balance with difficulty. I'll do you for that. You'll what? Come here. What are you going to do? Bleed on me? I'm invincible. You're a loony. The Black Knight always triumphs. How about you? Arthur takes his last leg off. The Black Knight, nugget body, lands upright. All right, we'll call it a draw. Come, Patsy. Arthur and Patsy start to cross the bridge. Running away, eh, you yellow bastard? Come back here and take what's coming to you. I'll bite your legs off. Five, exterior day. A village. Sounds of chanting of Latin cannon, punctuated by short sharp cracks it comes nearer we see there's a line of monks a la seventh seal flagellation scene chanting and banging themselves on the foreheads with wooden boards they pass a group of villagers who are dragging a beautiful young woman dressed as a witch through the streets they drag her to a strange house slash ruin standing on a hill outside the village a strange looking knight stands aside outside sir bedivere we have found a witch may we burn her a witch, a witch, burn her! How do you know she's a witch? She looks like one, yes she does! Bring her forward. They bring her forward, a beautiful young girl, Miss Islington, dressed up as a witch. I am not a witch, I am not a witch! But you are dressed as one. They dress me up like this! We did it, we did it! This is not my nose, it is a false one! But Avir takes her nose off. Well? Well, we did do the nose. The nose? And the hat, but she's a witch! A witch, a witch! Burn her! Did you dress her up like this? Um, yes. No, a bit. Yeah, she, she's got a war. Why do you think she's a witch? She turned me into a newt. And a newt? After looking at himself for some time, the second villager says, I got better. Burn her anyway. Quiet, quiet. There are ways of telling whether she is a witch. Arthur and Patsy ride up at this point and watch what follows with interest. There are? Tell up! What are they? Why, Sir Bedivere? Tell me. What do you do with witches? Burn them! And what do you do, and what do you burn, apart from the witches? A fourth villager goes, Wood. So why do witches burn? A second villager in Pianissimo says, Because they're made of wood! Good. Peasants stir around easily, then come round to this conclusion. I see, yes, of course. So, how can we tell if she is made of wood? 
make a bridge out of her. Ah, but can you not also make bridges out of stone? Ah, yes, of course. Um, uh... Does wood sink in water? No, no, it floats. Throw her in the pond. Tie weights on her. To a pond. Wait, wait. Tell me, what also floats on water? Bread? No, 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 no. Apples. Gravy. Very small rocks. A duck. They all turn and look at Arthur. Benefier looks up very impressed. Exactly. So, logically, the first villager beginning to pick up the threads. If she weighs the same as a duck, she's made of wood. And therefore... A witch! A duck! A duck! Fetch a duck! Here is a duck, Sir Benavir. We shall use my largest scales. He leads them a few yards to the very strange contraption indeed. Made of wood and rope and leather, they put the girl in one pan and the duck in another. Each pan is supported by a wooden stave. Benavir checks each pan, then... Arthur looks down with interest. Remove the supports. Two peasants knock them away with sledgehammers. The girl and duck sw swing slightly, but balance perfectly. A witch! A witch! It's a fair cop, says the witch. Burn her! Burn her! Let's make her into a ladder! Huh? The villagers drag the girl away, leaving Arthur and Bedivere regarding each other admir admiringly. Who are you who are so wise in the ways of science? I am Arthur! King of the Britons. My leash, forgive me. Arthur looks at Patsy with obvious satisfaction. Good sir knight, will you come with me to Camelot and join a number at the round table? My leash, I am honored. Arthur steps forward, drawing his sword with a slight hint of difficulty. What is your name? Bedivere, my liege. Then I derb you, Sir Bedivere, knight of the round table. Six various montage animation and a voiceover, and so King Arthur gathered his knights together, bringing from all the corners of the kingdom the strongest and bravest in the land to sit at the round table. Under this voiceover, we hear a montage of shots and Arthur recruiting his knights. Arthur, one, Arthur, Patsy, Bedivere, and Page, riding through Hillside, mix two, two, a castle, long shot of Sir Gaiwen standing outside and Arthur's group approaching and shaking hands, perhaps. Three, mixed to the group now, plus Sir Guy One and Page, who is weighted down by the enormous quantity of luggage, riding down by a stream and approaching Sir Hector, Arthur dubs him. Mixed to the group, now plus Hector and Page, approaching some group of buildings or whatever. <laughs> That's in the script. In the distance, Sir Robin is being taught the loot by one of his musicians. <laughs> Sorry. Arthur calls, and Sir Robin immediately reacts and hands the loot to his musician and comes to join Arthur and Co. Five. Mix of Sir Galahad, Gal Galahad, surrounded by his chickens. He is wearing a carpenter's apron over his immaculate armor and is finishing off a hen house. We see the group approach and he throws off the apron and puts down the hen house and goes to join them. Six. Mix to the group riding along again. Seven. Mix, m m mix to Sir Lancelot holding a handing a baby to his wife, who has several other children hanging about, and he strides off to join Arthur, leaving his castle, wife, and children. The castle, Eileen Danan, has washing hanging outside of it. A real family castle. There are at least six kids. Eight, mixed to the complete group, i.e. Arthur and Patsy, Bedivere and Page, Gaiwan and Page, Hector and Page, Galahad and Page, Sir Robin and six musicians, and Lancelot and Page. Six, close-up of a book on which is written, The Book of the Film. The voiceover says, The wise Sir Bedivere was the first to join King Arthur's knights, but other illustrious names were soon to follow. A hand turns the page. Sir Lancelot the Brave. A hand turns the page. Sir Galahad the Pure. A hand turns over the page. And Sir Robin the not-so-quite-so-pure Sir Lancelot. Hands turn over page. Who had nearly fought the Dragon of Agnor. And turns page. Who had nearly stood up to the victorious chicken of Bristol. Vicious chicken of Bristol. And turns page. Who had personally wet himself the Battle of Baden Hill in the aptly named. And turns page. 
Sir not appearing in this film. Hand turns page. Together they formed bands whose names and deeds were to be retold throughout the centuries. The Knights of the Round Table. <sighs> Sorry, excuse me. A gorilla's hand snatches away the hand. Music swells and fades as we mix through to... 7. Exterior Sunset. Fairly close head-on shot of the knights riding along, Bedivere and Arthur at the front of the group deep in conversation. And that, my lord, is how we know the earth to be banana-shaped. This new learning amazes me, Sir Bedivere. Explain again how sheep's bladders may be employed to prevent earthquakes. Of course, my liege. Hmm. Lancelot points. Look, my liege. They all stop and look. Come a lot! Cut to the shot of an amazing castle in the distance, illuminated in the rays of the setting sun. There is music. Cut back to Arthur and the group. They are all standing with fascination. Camelot. Camelot! Back to the page. And it's only a model. Shh! Knights! I bid you welcome to your new home. Let us ride to Camelot. Eight Interior Night. Cut to the interior of Medieval Hall. A large group of armored knights are engaged in a well choreographed song and dance routine of the very upbeat, if they could see me now, type of fast bouncing number. The poorer verses are made clearer by cutting to a group of knights actually engaged in the described task while the line itself is sung. They sing, We're the knights of the round table. We dance whenever we're able. We do routines and chorus scenes with footwork impeccable. We dine well here in Camelot. We ham and jam and spam a lot. We're knights of the round table. Our shows are formidable. But many times we're given rhymes that are quite unsingable. We're opera mad and Camelot. We'll sing from the diaphragm a lot. Booming Bass is a routine where two xylophonists play part of the knight's armor, producing a pleasing effect. In war we're tough and able, quite indefinable. Between our quests we're sweet, we seek to invest, and person ain't quite able. It's a busy life in Camelot. I have to push the Pramelot. Cut back to Arthur and Bedivere in company as we had left them. No one second thought, let's not go to Camelot. Right! It is a silly place. Whew. I am not good at singing. Sorry about that. They set off against almost. They set off again almost immediately. They are suffused in ethereal radiance and strangely heavenly choir music. The pages, horse-like, take fright for a moment. They whinny and rattle their coconuts. Arthur and the knights fall on their knees. A holy voice booms out. Arthur, Arthur, King of the Britons. They all prostrate themselves even further. Oh, don't grovel! Do get up! If there's one thing I can't stand, it's people groveling! Arthur and company rise. Sorry. And don't apologize! Every time I try to talk to someone, it's sorry this, and forgive me that, and I'm not worthy, and what are you doing now? I'm averting my eyes, Lord. Well, don't! I really don't know where all this got started. It's all like those miserable psalms. They're so depressing. Now knock it off. Mm. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Right. Arthur, King of the Britons, your knights of the round table shall have a task to make them example in these dark times. Good idea, O oh Lord. Of course it's a good idea. Suddenly, another light glows besides God, or possibly within the light, which is God, a shape slowly starts to form. Behold, Arthur, this is the Holy Grail, the sacred cup from which Christ drank at the Last Supper. The form in the bright light is just discernible as an iridescent chalice. The knights gasp. Look, well, Arthur, for it is your sacred task to seek this grail. It begins to fade. Music's crescendo as both lights fade. This is your purpose, Arthur. The quest for the Holy Grail. It is gone. All the knights are left gasping in awe and wonderment. They all turn and look at Arthur. A blessing, a blessing from the Lord. Praise be to God. An odd pause. Then Arthur rallies them. 
we have a task. We must waste no time. To Camelot. God be praised. Oh, Galahad's Irish. Yeah, I like that. Stirring music crescendo. They ride off. Cut to title sequence, animation, the quest for the Holy Grail, after titles cut to. Nine exterior, ca exterior castle day. Mix through one or two shots of them on their way again until they approach a terrific castle. A little one would do, too. They advance quite close to the castle and draw themselves into a line. At a signal from Arthur, the two pages step forward and give a brief fanfare. A man appears on the battlements. Arthur addresses him. Hello. Hello. Who is it? I can't do a French accent. I'm sorry. It's, it's, uh... I am King Arthur, and these are the knights of the round table. Whose castle is this? This is the castle of my master, Guy. I'm doing Irish now, of course. This is the castle of my master, Guy de Lombard. Please, go and tell your master that we've been charged by God with a sacred quest. And if you give us food and shelter for this night, he can join us in our quest for the Holy Grail. Well, I'll ask him, but I don't think he'll be very keen. He's already got one, you see. What? He says they've already got one. They are stunned. Are you sure he's got one? Oh, yes. It's very nice. Dude, I can't get this guy's accent. Now. Cut to the battlements. The taunter, man, turns to some others. I told him we already got one. <laughs> well, can we come up and have a look? Of course not. You are English pigs. I can't, I can't do the accent. Well, what are you then? I'm French. Why do you think I have this outrageous accent? You're silly king. I can't. I... What are you doing in England? Mind your business. It will show. If you will not show us the grail, we shall storm your castle. Murmurs of assent. You don't frighten us, English pig dog. Go and boil your bottom, son of a silly person. I blow my nose on you. So call Arthur King. You and your silly English. I'm. Well, you can see that. I'm not saying that. He puts hands to his ears and blows a raspberry. What a strange person. Now look here, my good men. I don't want to talk to you no more, you empty-headed animal. Food trough wiper. I fart in your general direction. Your mother was a hamster and your father a smith of raspberries. I got the French accent down now when he finally stops talking, of course. Is there someone else up there we could talk to? No, now go away, or I shall taunt you a second time. Now is your last chance. I've been more than reasonable. Fetches Levitch. Quoi? Fetches Levitch. Cut back to the battlements. A cow is let out of a stall. Come back to Arthur. Now that this is my final offer, if you are not prepared to agree to my demands, I feel forced to take. Oh Christ! A cow comes flying over the battlements, low, mowing, mooing aggressively. The cow lands on Galahad's page, squashing him completely. What a cruel thing to do! Choking back tears. It hasn't even been milked. Right, knight, forward! Arthur leads a charge toward the castle. Various shots of them battling on, despite being hit by a variety of farm animals. Arthur, as the man next to him is squashed by a sheep, Knights, run away! Midst echoing shots of run away, the knights retreat to cover with the odd cow or goose hitting him still. The knights crouch down under cover. Launchalant says, The sods! I'll tear them apart! Arthur, restraining Lancelot from going out having a go, No! But Devere says, I have a plan, sir. Cut back to the battlements of Castle. French sentries suspiciously peering towards the English lines. Wind whistles. Shots of the empty scrublander under undergrowth or woodland around the castle. Emptiness. Wind. More shots of the French sentries peering into the dusk. As night falls, mix through to night on the battlements, a brazier burns or torches on the wall as the sentries peer into the dark. Shots of the woodlands with fire burning where the English lines are. During all this, the sounds of extensive carpentry have possibly been heard, followed by silence, followed by renewed outbursts of activity. Close up French looking very nervous, dawn breaking, shots of woodland, nothing, wind, dawn still breaking, shots of the French. They suddenly hear something, 
a faintly detectable squeaking, which is getting louder. Whew. Cut to the wide shot of the castle in Woodland. Woodland. Squeaking getting louder. Shot of the French taunter pointing. Wide shot again. The squeaking gets louder. An enormous 20-foot-high wooden rabbit is wheeled out of the undergrowth into the open space in front of the castle. The English scuttle back into the undergrowth. The rabbit has a large red bow tied around it and a rather crudely written label, which reads, Pour des trois armées français. I, I can't speak French. The chief taunter looks at it, narrowing his eyes. Then he turns and leaves battlements. Cut to Arthur and company watching from the bushes. The main gate of the castle opens a little and the chief taunter's head sticks out. Then another froggy head, then another. They mutter to each other in French, look rather pleased, then rush out and start to pull the giant rabbit in. Cut back to Arthur and the company behind some bushes watching. Now what happens? Well now, Lancelot, Galahad, and I wait until nightfall and then leap out of the rabbit and take the French by surprise. Not only by surprise, but totally unarmed. Who? Who breaks out? Er, we, Lancelot, Galahad, and I, er, leap out of the rabbit and Lancelot covers his eyes. Look, if we were to build a large wooden badger, Arthur cuffs him. Arthur looks to the battlements. There's a loud twang. A look of horror. The rabbit comes sailing over the battlements. Run away! More shouts. Run away! Sir Guy one to his page as they run away. It's only a model. Shh! They continue to retreat. The rabbit lands on Guy one's page, who is already weighed down by an enormous quantity of luggage. 10. Exterior. Castle walls. Day. Cut to a man in modern dress standing outside the castle. He speaks straight to camera in a documentary kind of way. Supergirl's caption, a very famous historian. Defeat at the castle seems to have utterly disheartened King Arthur. The ferocity of the French daunting took him completely by surprise, and Arthur became convinced that a new strategy was required if the quest for the Holy Grail was to be brought to a successful conclusion. Arthur, having consulted his closet, closest knights, decided that they should prepare... They should separate and search for the grotto individually. Now, this is what they did. No sooner. A knight rides in the shot and hacks him to the ground. He rides off. We stay for a moment on the glade. A middle-aged lady in C and A, twin set merges from the trees and looks in horror at the body of her husband. Mrs. Horgan says, Frank! Cuts an animated frame with the words, The Tale of Sir Robin on it. Pleasant pastoral music. Mixed through to voice. The tale of Sir Robin. Ooh, sorry. I ate pizza before this. It wasn't really a great idea. Eleven exterior. Exterior? Exterior. Glade day. Oh, God, that's kind of dangerous. Whatever. A knight is trotting along through a wooden sun dapple of glade, followed by his trusty page banging the usual half coconuts. As we see them approach, we hear the beautiful lilting sound of medieval music and see that the knight is followed by a small routine of musicians in third century courtly costume. One sings and plays the tambourine, one bangs on a tabor, a small drum, O-E-D, and one plays the pipes. The knight looks very proud and firm as we hear the first part of the song, but the combination of the lyrics and the large signs they pass start to have their effects. Bravely bold Sir Robin rode from Camelot. He was not too afraid to die, your brave Sir Robin. He was not at all afraid to be killed in nasty ways. Brave, 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 brave Sir Robin. He was not in the least bit scared to be mashed into a pulp, or to have his eyes get out and his elbows broken, to have his kneecap slip and his body burned away, and all his limbs all hacked and smangled, brave Sir Robin. His head smashed in, his heart cut out, his liver removed, his bowels unplugged, his nostrils raped, his bottom burned off, and his penis slit, and his... Uh, that's enough. That's enough music for a while, lads. It looks as like if it's a dirty work of foot. Brave Sir Rob. Shut up. They have ridden past the following signs, all in triplicate Camelot 43, Certain Death 1, and then Beware, Go Back, Dead People Only, you know. 12 Exterior Glade Day. They now pass three knights impaled to a tree, with their feet off the ground. With one lance through a lot of them, they are all skewered like a barbecue. 
They then pass three knights sitting on the ground with one enormous axe through their skulls. They look to Morris. Then a huge tree is absolutely packed with maidens tied to it. They all look fed up. Sir Robin calls out cheerfully as he passes. Morning. Bye. Sir Robin rides on a little way with the music building up enormous and terrifying tension until suddenly there standing before him is an enormous three-headed knight. Halt. Who art thou? He is brave, Sir Robin. Brave, Sir Robin. Who... Shut up. Oh, nobody really. Just passing through. What do you want? To fight and... Shut up. Nothing really. Just to pass through, good Sir Knight. I'm afraid not. This is my bit of the forest. Find your own bit. I am a knight of King Arthur's Round Table. I seek the Holy Grail. Stand aside and let me pass. You are a knight of the Round Table? I am. From now on, the three heads speak individually. Shit. In that case, I shall have to kill you. Shall I? I don't think so. I'm not sure. What do I think? I think kill him. Uh, no, I'm still not sure. All right, how many of me think I should kill him? I do. One. That's not a quorum. It is if I'm the chairman. Uh, ooh, it's not. I'm the chairman this week. You're not. Look, it'll make it much simpler if I vote with me. Do kill him. Yeah. Oh. Oh, damn. First head saying to Sir Elvin, Knight, I decided to kill you. With one absenting. Knight, I decided to kill you with one absenting. Sorry about this, but I have to be fair. Oh, that's all right. So you're going to kill me with your big axe. I don't know with my sword. Dagger. Maze is quicker. No, no, the sword is easier. He said axe. Look, hurry up, six eyes, or shall I cut your head off? Third head to Sir Robin, referring to his first head. For God's sake, cut that one off, and do us all a favor. What do you mean? Yapping on all the time. You're lucky you're not next to him. What do you mean? You snore. Ooh, lies. Anyway, you've got bad breath. <laughs> I haven't. Both third and first heads turn away slightly, making faces. It's not my fault. It's what you both eat. Look, stop this bitchin'. I've got a knight to kill. He's buggered off. So he has. He's scabbered. This is all you folk. No, it's not. First head swiping himself. Take that. Ow. I'm, s I'm sorry. Here. Stop it. I'll teach you. The body starts laying into itself with sword and mace, while the heads argue and shout with pain. We pan gently across to the maidens on their tree. They are still very fed up. I suppose we're lucky he's only got three heads. Chance would be a fine thing. Oh, let's be nice to him. Oh, shut up. Perhaps I could... Oh, quick, get the sword out. I want to cut his head off. Ow, cut your own head off. Yes, do us all a favor. What? Yapping on all the time. You're lucky you're not next to him. What do you mean? You snore. Only because you don't brush my teeth. Oh, stop bickering and let's go and have tea and biscuits. Alright, alright. We'll kill him first and then have tea and biscuits. Yes! Oh, not biscuits. Alright, alright. Not biscuits, but let's kill him anyway. Wide shot of the three-headed knight is alone. He's buggered off. So, he's had. He's scapered. 13 exterior glade day. Quick sequence of Sir Robin. The music is jolly and bright, as if triumphant. Robin is not at all happy with the lyrics. Brave Sir Robin ran away. I didn't. Bravely ran away, away. 
No, no, no. When danger veered its ugly head, he bravely turned his tail in flight. Yes, brave Sir Robin turned about and gallantly he chickened out. Brave ta bravely taken to his feet, he breathed a very brief retreat. Bravest of the brave Sir Robin, petrified of being dead, soldiers pants and brave Sir Robin turned away and fled. They disappeared into the distance. Animation. The turn, the pick, the tail of Sir Galahad. 14. Exterior. Storm. Forest. Dusk. As the storm rages, as we pick up Galahad, forcing his way through brambles and over, and over slippery rocks, progress is hard. He pauses, and at this moment, we hear the howling of wolves. Galahad turns and then hurries onward even more urgently. Another louder, closer howl is heard, and Galahad stumbles and falls heavily. Though obviously injured, he bravely struggles forward a little and regains his feet, retract, reacting with pain. More louder, closer howling. howling. He grips his sword violently, and as he glances around, a flash of lightning reveals the silhouette of a huge, terrifying castle. Perhaps looking rather derelict, he makes up his mind in an instant and stumbles manfully towards it. More louder howling. He reaches the, the forbidding, enormous doors of the castle and beats on the doors with the handle of his sword, looking over his shoulder the while. Pause. He beats again, shouting, Open! Open the doors! In the name of King Arthur, open the doors! I am Sir Galahad, a knight of the round table! Some suitable noises are heard inside. I am on a quest for the Holy Grail! I seek shelter! Some rattling, chainy noises come from inside with huge bolts being drawn. The wolves howling is very close. As the door creaks open, Galahad steps quickly inside. Fifteen interior, castle, night. From inside, we see Galahad enter, wiping the rain from his eyes, and turn as the door cracks behind him. Galahad turns to the door, reacting to the fact he is trapped. Zoot, zoot, out of vision. Hello. Galahad turns back. We see from his POV the lovely Zoot standing by him, smiling enchantingly, and a number of equally delectable girlies draped around in a seductively poltised room. They look at him smilingly and wave. Hello. Welcome, gentle Sir Knight. Welcome to Castle Anthrax. The Castle Anthrax! Yes, it's not a very good name, is it? But we are nice and we shall attend to your every, every need. Er, You are the keepers of the Holy Grail! The what? But you are tired and you must rest a while. Midget Crapper! Midget and Crapper. Yes, so Zoot. Prepare a bed for our guest. Midget and Crapper groveling with delight. Oh, thank you, Zoot. Thank you, thank you. Away! Violetisses. To Galahad. The beds here are warm and soft and very, very big. Well, look, er, my... What is your name, handsome knight? Er, uh, Sir Galahad. The chast. Mine is Zoot. Just Zoot. She's very close to him for a moment. But come. She turns away and leads him towards the door, leading to a corner leading to the bedchamber. Well, look, I'm afraid I really ought to be. Sir Galahad! There's a gasp from the other girls. You would not be so gallant as to refuse our hospitality! Galahad looks at the other girls. They are clearly on the verge of being offended. Well. She moves off. And Galahad unwillingly follows. I'm afraid our light must seem very dull and quiet compared to yours. We are but eight score young blondes, all between sixteen and nineteen and a half, caught off in this castle, with no one to protect us. Ooh, it's a lonely life. Bathing, dressing, undressing, making exciting underwear. They reach the end of the corridor and enter the bedchamber. Zoot turns. We are just not used to handsome knights. She notices him limping. But you are wounded. No, it's nothing. You must see the doctors immediately. She claps again. You must lie down. She almost forces him to lie on the bed as Piglet and Winston enter the room. They are equally beautiful and dressed exotically. They approach Galahad. Well, what seems to be the trouble? They're doctors. They have a basic medical training. Yes, now you must try to rest. Dr. Winston, Dr. Piglet, practice your art. Try to relax. No, look, really, this isn't necessary. We must examine you. There's nothing wrong with <clears throat> that. Piglet slightly irritated. Please, we are doctors. 
Zoot reappears. Galahad tries for one brief moment to relax. Then there is a sharp, sharp boing from the lower part of his armor. Winston glances quickly in the appropriate direction as Galahad sits up and starts getting off the bed and collecting his armor, saying, No, no, this cannot be. I am sworn to chastity. Back to your bed at once. I'm sorry. I must go. He launches out of the accident and run away. Galahad hurries to the door and pushes through it. As he leaves the room, we cut to the reverse to show that he is now in a room full of bathing and romping girls. Girlies, he says. All innocent, wide-eyed, and beautiful. They smile enchantingly at him as he tries to keep walking without being diverted by the lovely sights assaulting his eyeballs. He nods to them stiffly once or twice, and in his eye catches a particularly stunning young lady. He visibly gulps with repressed emotion and cannot resist saying, Good evening, ah, uh, zoot er. No, I am Zoot's identical twin sister, Dingo. Oh, well, I'm sorry, but I must leave immediately. <coughs> <coughs> sorry, sorry. Good boy. No, no, bad, bad, Zoot. Er, why? She's been lying again. She told us you had promised to stay forever. Oh? Oh, well, you excuse me. Where are you going? I have seen the Grail. I have seen it here in this castle. No, oh no, bad, bad suit. What is it? Bad, wicked, naughty suit. She has been setting fire to our beacon, which I have just remembered is Grail shaped. It is not the first time we've had this problem. It's not the real Grail. Wicked, wicked suit. She is a bad person. She must pay the penalty. And here in Cal. Castle Anthrax, we have but one punishment. You must tie her down on the bed and spank her. Come! A spanking, a spank! Say the girls. Ooh. I need to catch my breath. You must spank her as well, and after you spank her, you may deal with her as you like. And then, spank me. And spank me, and spank me, and me! Yes, yes, you must give us all a good spanking. A spanking, spanking, this is going to be a spanking night. And then after spanking, the oral, yes. Oh dear, well I... Why is he southern now? Trying to do Irish, or Scottish, or something. Well, you know, they say, the oral sex, the oral sex, Galahad says, well, I suppose I could stay a bit longer. I don't want to give up the names, I'm almost halfway there. At this moment, there is a commotion behind, and Sir Lancelot and Concord, possibly plus Skywin, burst into the bathing area with swords drawn and form themselves around Sir Galahad, threatening the girls. Sir Galahad! Oh! Hello! Quick! Why? You're in great peril! No, he isn't! Silence, fellow temptress! Well, she's got a point. We'll cover your escape! Look, I'm fine! Sir Galahad! He threatens Dingo. No, look, I can tackle this lot single-handed. Yes, yes, let him tackle us single-handed. Come, Sir Galahad, quickly. No, really, I can cope. I can handle this lot easily. Yes, let him handle us easily. No, sir, quick. He starts pulling Galahad away. Oh my god, this takes forever. How long am I... I don't even want to know. One hour. <sighs> Alright, well, this is our one hour break. Just need to catch my breath. How's your days going? Mine's going pretty well. I had pizza today. That was nice. Shouldn't have eaten it before this, though. Because I'm burping it up. And I don't have enough water. I don't have any water up here. Anyway. He starts pulling Galahad away. No, please, please, I can defeat them. There's only a hundred. He will beat us easily. We haven't a chance. Oh, shit. By now, Lancelot and Concord have hustled Galahad out of the bathing area and are running through the outside door. We were in a nick of time. You were in great peril. Galahad dragging his feet somewhat. I don't think I was. You were, Sir Galahad. You were in great peril. Look. Let me go back in there and face the peril. It's too perilous. 
They are right outside the castle by now. Look, it is my duty as a knight to try and sample as much peril as I can. No, no, we must find the grail. The thunderstorm is over. A bunch of pages are tethered to a tree with more men waiting. Their tethers are untied and the pages start banging away with their coconuts. Galahad is swept along with them as they ride off. Oh, let me go and have a bit of peril. No, it's unhealthy. I bet you're gay. No, I'm not. Guy one or Concord gives a knocking glance at Lancelot. Voice comes in as they ride off. Sir Lancelot had saved Galahad from almost certain temptation, but they were still lost. Far from the goal of their search for the Holy Grail, only Bedeaver and King Arthur himself, or Aiden day and night, had made any progress. 16. Animation Live Action Arthur and Bedeaver in the depths of a dark forest with an old blind soothsayer. He lies in a broken down old woman's hut. And this enchantment of whom you speak, has he seen the grail? The soothsayer laughs forbiddingly, adding to the general spookiness of this encounter. Where does he live? He stares into the blind eyes of the old man. Old man, where does he live? He knows of a cave. A cave which no man has entered. And the grail, the grail is in there? The blind man laughs again to himself. There is much danger, for beyond the cave lies the gorge of eternal peril, which no man has ever crossed. But the grail, where is the grail? Seek you with a bridge of death. The bridge of death, which leads to the grail. The old man laughs sinisterly and mockingly. They look down and he is gone. They stand up. Something behind them is a noise. They turn sharply in the door of the little hut, and it's a cat. It meows and is gone. They slowly back out of the hut. As they touch the door post, they just flake away into dust. The whole hut is rotten. It collapses. Spooky music. They are thoroughly shaken, and they begin to hear noises of people moving in the forest around them. They start to back cautiously away from the hut. Suddenly, there is a heavy footfall behind them. They turn to fear, and sudden cut the big close-up of a frighteningly black-browed evil face the hero of troop 68 the tall knight of knee knee arthur and bedeva recoil in abject fear patsy rears up with coconuts arthur to patsy says easy boy easy arthur appears into the darkness who are you six voices from the darkness knee pen knee womp an extraordinarily tall knight in all black, possibly John with Mike on his shoulders, <laughs> walks out from the dark trees. He's extremely fierce and gruesome countenance. He walks towards King Arthur and Patsy, who are wazing like mad. So, Solipin slang meaning very scared, almost to the point of wetting oneself, e.g. before an important football match or prior to a posturing. Salopian slang meaning a beating by the school preposterers. Sorry about the Salopian slang to this stage direction. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Arthur with a waist stiff. Who are you, tall knight? We are the knights who say knee. No, not the knights who say knee. The same. Who are they? We are the keepers of the sacred words. Knee ping and knee wom. Those who hear them seldom live to tell the tale. The knights who say knee demand a sacrifice. Arthur, to the tall knight, says, Knights who say knee, we are but simple travelers. We seek the enchanter who lives beyond this wood and who. Knee! Oh! Arthur recoils. Knee! Knee! I feel like I'm going to say the N-word. Arthur, cowering in fear, says, Oh! We shall say knee again to you if you do not appease us. All right, all right, what do you want? We want a shrubbery. A what? Knee, 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 peng, knee, wum. The pages rear and snort and rattle the coconuts. All right, all right, no more, please. We will find you. 
a shrubbery. You must return here with a shrubbery, or else you shall not pass through this wood alive. Thank you, knight who say knee. You are fair and just. We will return with a shrubbery. One that looks nice. Of course. And not too expensive. Yes. Now, go! <coughs> Ooh. Arthur and Bedeever turn and ride off. Ni ni peng ni wong. Seventeen exterior day. Cut back to the historian lying in the glade. His wife, who has been kneeling beside him, rises as two police patrolmen enter the glade. They bend over her husband. One takes out a notebook. Cut to an animated tale: the tale of Sir Lancelot. 18 interior prince room and castle day a young quite embarrassingly unattractive prince is gazing out of a castle window his father stands behind him beside him he is also looking out the prince wears a long white undershirt like a nightshirt one day lad all this will be yours what the curtains no not the curtains lad all that indicating the vista from the window all that you can see Stretch out over the hills and valleys, as far as I can see and beyond. That will be your kingdom, lad. But, mother... Father, lad. But, father, I don't really want any of that. Listen, lad. I built this kingdom up from nothing. All I had when I started was swamp. Other kings said I was daft to build a castle on a swamp, but I built it all the same, just to show them. It sank into the swamp, so I built another one. That sank into the swamp, I built another one. That fell over and then sank into the swamp. So I built another. And that stayed up. And that's what you're gonna get, lad. The most powerful kingdom in this island. But I don't want to do that. I'd rather... Well, I thought of what? I'd rather just... Sing. You're not going to do the song when I'm here. And the music that did start stops. Listen, lad. In 20 minutes, you're going to be married to a girl whose father owns the biggest flocks of open land in Britain. I don't want land. Listen, Alice. Herbert. Herbert. We built this castle in a bloody swamp. We need all the land we can get. But I don't like her. Don't like her? What's wrong with her? She's beautiful. She's rich. She's got huge tracts of land. I know, but I want the girl that I married to have a certain special something. Music intro for song starts. Cut that out. Music cuts off abruptly. You're Mary and Princess Lucky, so you better get used to the idea. Guards! Two guards enter. As my cat's pawing into the door. Sorry. Uh, two guards enter and stand to the attention on either side of the door. One of them has hiccups and so does so throughout. Make sure the prince doesn't leave this room until I come and get him. Not to leave the room. Even if you come and get him. No, until I come and get him. Until you come and get him, we're not to enter the room. No, you stay in the room and I'll make sure he doesn't leave. And you'll come and get him. That's right. We don't need to do anything apart from just stop him entering the room. Leave in the room. Leave in the room. Yes. Go eight. <coughs> Far farther makes to leave. Er, if we er, yes. If we er, tr the first card is just trying to remember what he was going to say. Look, it's simple. Just stay here and make sure he doesn't leave the room. <coughs> yeah, that's a hiccup. Sorry. It's fine. Mm. All right. Oh, I remember. Can he er, can he leave the room with us? The father carefully says, No, keep him in the air. Make sure he doesn't leave. Now make sure he doesn't. Okay, oh yes, we'll keep him in here, obviously. But if he had to leave and we were with him, No, just keep him in here. Until you or anyone else. No, not anyone else. Just me. Just you. Get back. All right. Okay, fine. We'll remain here until you get back. And make sure and make sure he doesn't leave. What? 
Make sure he doesn't leave. The prince? Yes. Make sure... Oh, yes, of course. I thought you meant him. He points to the other guard and laughs himself. You know, it seemed a bit daft me having to guard him when he's a guard. Is that Claire? <laughs> oh, yes, that's quite clear. No problems. The father pulls open the door and makes to leave the room. The guard follows. The father says to the guards, Where are you going? I'm coming with you. No, I want you to stay here and make sure he doesn't leave. The room until I get back. Oh, I see. Right. They take up positions on either side of the door. But father, shut your noise here and get that suit on. He points to a wedding suit on a table or chair. Father throws one last look at the boy and turns, goes out, and slams the door. The prince slumped, slumps onto the window seat, looking forlornly out of the window. A music intro to a song starts. The door flies open, the music cuts off, and father pokes his hand in. And no singing! Hick. As the father leaves, he says, go and have a drink of water. Father slams the door again. The guard takes up their position. The son gazes out into the window again. Sighs. Thanks. A thought strikes him. He gets up, crosses through his desk, and scribbles a quick note and impales it on an arrow. Takes a bow down from the wall and fires the arrow out of the window. He looks wetly defiant at the guards, who smile pleasantly. Fifteen exterior, a forest day. Cut to the middle of the forest. Sir Lancelot is riding along with a trusty servant, Concord. And over we go! He strides over a big tree trunk. His horse does run and jump. <laughs> well taken, Concord. Thank you, sir. Most kind. And another! Concord misses a beat. Steady, good. And the last one. Concord does the ride up with the coconuts. He does the break for the leap. And there's a thwack. Sir Lancelot is waiting for the horse to land. Message for you, sir. He falls forward, revealing the arrow with the note. Concord, speak to me. He realizes he might be in danger and starts to crawl off when he notices the note. He takes it out and reads it. To whoever finds this note, I have been imprisoned by my father who wishes me to marry against my will. Please, 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 please come and rescue me. I am in the tall tower of Swamp Castle. Sir Lancelot's eyes light up with holy inspiration. At last, a call! A cry of distress. He draws his swords and turns to Concord. Concord! Brave Concord! You shall not have died in vain! I'm not quite dead, sir. A little deflated, Lancelot says. Oh, but, uh, brave Concord! You shall not have been fatally wounded in vain. I think I can pull through, sir. Good Concord. Stay here and rest a while. He makes the leap off dramatically. I think I'll be all right to come with you, sir. I will sell help, brave friend, as soon as I've accomplished this most daring, desperate adventure in this genre. Really? I feel fine, sir. Farewell, Concord. It just seems a little silly, me lying here. Sir Lancelot plunges off into the forest. 20 Exterior Castle Gateway. Day. Two hanging banners on one side of the gate with the monogram H and L. Two sentries with spears. Slightly weddingly, red ribbons on their right spears. Uh, we can hear from inside revelry and celebration music. We hear Lancelot's footsteps. The two sentries are watching him. One of them raises his hand. Halt, friend. Lancelot leaps in the shot with a mighty cry and runs the guard through and hacks him to the floor. Blood. Swashbuggling music, perhaps. Lancelot races into the castle screaming. Hey! He looks at his mutilated comrade. 21. Exterior. Day. Cut to inside of the castle grounds or courtyard. In the sunlight, beautifully dressed wedding guests are arriving, converging on the doorway. A country dance in progress. Sir Lancelot rushes towards them. Cuts to handheld close-ups as he charges through the crowd, hacking right and left, a la Errol Flynn, at all who come in his way. He fights his way through the county country dance. Blood, shrieks, bemused looks of guests, not horror so much as comprehending surprise. Possibly Errol Flynn music. One country dancer is left holding just a hand. Ooh. Right and left, the guests crumple in pools of blood as he fights his way through the door and into the main hall. 22 interior day cut to the interior main hall sound of busy preparations men setting up huge hog heads of wine men putting up lar last minute flower arrangements uh, cooks bearing huge trays of 
food, pies, suckling pigs, a swan, boar's head, etc. The bot, the, the, the Biden, the Biden, the Biden, Joe Biden, the bride being dressed by several attendants, father ordering servants around, organizing the steward, etc. Sir Lancelot bursts through the middle of them, slashing heroically, hacking, wounding, and killing. Again, fairly close-up chaotic shots. We see guests stagger back wounded. A cook bites the dust, etc. Sir Lancelot eventually reaches the staircase, runs up it, and into a small door. 23, interior, day. Cut to Sir Lancelot running up a spiral staircase. He, he reaches the door of the prince's room. He flings it open. Ah, now we're not allowed to. Sir Lancelot runs him through, grabs his spear, and stabs the other guard who collapses in a heap. He coughs quietly. Sir Lancelot runs to the window and kneels down in front of the prince, adverting his head. O oh, fair one, behold your humble servant, Sir Lancelot, from the court of Camelot. I have come to take you. He looks up for the first time and his voice trails away. I'm terribly sorry. You got my note. Well, yes, you've come to rescue me. Well, yes, but I hadn't realized. His eyes light up. I knew that someone would come. I knew someone out there. There must be... Music intro into song. Father, suddenly looking to the door. Stop that! Music cuts out. Father sees Sir Lancelot still kneeling before his son. Here are ye. I'm your son, not ye. Sir Lancelot, half standing self-consciously. I'm uh, Sir Lancelot, sir. He's come to rescue me, father. Ah, uh, well, let's not jump to conclusions. Did you kill all those guards? Yes, I'm um, very sorry. They cost 50 pounds each. Well, I really am most awfully sorry, but I, I, I can explain everything. Don't be afraid of him, Sir Lancelot. I've got a rope here already. He throws a rope out of the window, which is tied to a pillar in the room. He looks rather pleased with himself that he got it already. Yeah, kill it, wedding guest and all. Uh, well, <laughs> the thing is, I thought your son was a lady. I can understand that. The prince, who is already halfway out the window. Hurry, brave Sir Lancelot. The father to his son says, shut up. To the Lancelot, he says, you only killed the bride's father, that's all. Oh, dear, I didn't really mean to. I didn't mean to, you put your sword right through his head. Gosh, is he alright? You even kicked the bride in the chest, it's going to cost me a fortune. I can explain. I was in the forest riding north of Camelot when I got this note. Camelot? How do you from Camelot? The prince's head peeps over the windowsill. Hurry! I am, sir. I'm going to the King Arthur. Mm. Very nice castle, Camelot. Very good pig country. Is it? The prince out of vision says, I'm ready, Sir Lancelot. Do you want to come and have a drink? The Lancelot says, Oh, that's that's awfully nice. The prince, out of vision, loud and shrill, says, I am ready! As they walk past the rope, the father nonchalantly cuts it with his knife. There is no sound except for a pause, a slight squeal from very far away, as the prince makes contact with the ground. Contact, not content. <laughs> It's just that when I'm in the strata, I tend to get overexcited and start to leap around and weave my sword about and... Oh, don't worry about it. Tell me. Doesn't Camelot own that sort of farmland up by the mountains? He puts his arm around Lancelot's shoulder as they go to the door. 24. Interior. Day. Cut to the Great Hall. Guests wounded and bloody are tending to the dead and injured, sighs and groans. The princess in her white wedding dress is holding her chest and coughing blood. People dabbing the stains off her dress. Father and Sir Lancelot start to walk down the grand staircase, talking to each other. One of the guests notices and points to Sir Lancelot. There he is! As one man, all remaining, as one man, all remaining able-bodied men look up and make for the staircase, muttering angrily. Sir Lancelot grabs his sword. Hold it! But it is too late. <laughs> Sir Lancelot cannot be stopped. With fearless abandon, he throws himself into the crowd and starts hacking and slashing. He has carved quite a number before the father can stop him and pull them back onto the stairs. Renewed groans and cries. 
Hold it! Please! Sorry, sorry. With a bitter self-reproach. There, you see, I just got excited again, and I got carried away. I'm, I'm ever so sorry. I'm sorry. The crowd kneeling round their wounded again, moated, etc. He killed the best man! Holding, a second guest holding a left woman says, He killed my auntie. Father, no, please, this is supposed to be a happy occasion. Let's not bicker and argue about who kills who. We are here today to witness the union of two young people in the joyful bond of the Holy Willock. Unfortunately, one of them, my son Herbert, has just fallen to his death. Murmurs from the crowd. The bride smiles with relief and coughs again. But I don't want to think I've not lost a son so much as gained a daughter. Smattering of applause. For since the tragic death of her father, shot from the back, he's not quite dead since the fatal wounding of her father. I think he's getting better. The father nods discreetly to a soldier standing to one side. The soldier slips off. Father's eye watch him move round to where the voice came from. For since her own father, whom, when he seemed about to recover, suddenly felt the icy hand of death upon him, the scuffle in the back, shuffle in the back, oh, he's died! I want only his daughter, from now onwards, to think of me as her old dad, in a very real and legally binding sense. Applause, and I'm sure, sure, at the merger, er, the union between the princess and the brave but dangerous Sir Lancelot of Camelot. What? A gasp comes from the crowd. The dead prince! There's a concord holding the dead prince in his arms. He's not quite dead! I feel much better. You fell into your tall tower, you creep! I was saved at the last minute. How? Well, I'll tell you. The music intro to the song. Concord stands the sun on his feet and adopts Khan. And now a number from my free... From, now a member... Number... Number... From my friend pose. Not like that! But the music doesn't stop. And the crowd starts to sing. He's gonna tell! Shut up! He's gonna tell! The father now screaming says, Shut up! As the song starts, the father tries yelling at them and eventually gives up. Sir Lancelot joins Concord in the crowd. We must escape quickly before the song. Come with me, sir. You're not right for this genre. I must escape more dramatically. Quickly, sir! Come this way! No, it's not right for my idiom. I must escape more... More... Dramatically, sir? Dramatically. He's going to tell, he's going to tell, he's going to tell about his great escape once he fell a long way. But he's here with us today. What a wonderful escape. Whew. I'm getting lightheaded. Concord goes. Sir Lancelot runs back up the stairs, grabs a rope out of, off the wall, and swings out over the heads of the crowd in a swashbuckling manner towards a large window. He stops just short of the window, and his left swing pathetically back and forth. Excuse me, could somebody give me a push? 25 exterior, a deserted village, dusk. Toothless old crone by the roadside. Arthur and Bedeever and two pages ride up and draw up alongside the crone. Is there anywhere we could buy a shrubbery? The old crone crosses herself with a look of stark terror. Who sent you? The knights who sent me. Ah... She looks round and rear. Rear? Yeah, rear. No, we have no shrubberies here. Surely there must be. Arthur restrains from threatening the lady. It does not be good. It will not be good to argue. These simple people are terrified of the knights who say me. She shudders. Oh, the cowards or whatever. Arthur takes Medivh further aside. There is only one way to get the information we want. Send her a letter from along the way. Uh, no, we must talk to her in funny voices. No. How about trying ourselves to a tree? In a gritting voice. No. Our only hope is to make her as afraid of us as she is of the awful knights who say me. Ah, it ourselves with a big rock. He nods knowingly. No. Nothing we can do us ourselves will frighten her as much as what we can do to her. 
Ah, we must threaten to say me. Oh, no. They reapproach the old crone, who is cowering more than ever. Listen, old crone, unless you tell us why we can buy it. I am King Arthur, send the beans. Listen, old crone, unless you tell us where we can buy a shrubbery, my friend and I, we will say nee. Do ye worst. I have heard the knights say nee in the night. I have heard the hideous peng, and they have said nee wum to my sister. But still, I am not revealed. Very, very well, old crone, since you will not assist us voluntarily. Nee. No, never. No shrubberies. Nee! No! 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 Nee! More like this! Nee! 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 <laughs> it's not working! You're not doing it properly! Nee! Nee! That's it! Nee! Nee! A passerby and a horse is observing them. Are you saying nee to that old rope? Uh, yes! Oh! What sad times are these when passing ruffians can say nee at will the old ladies. There is a pestilence upon this land. Nothing is sacred. Even those who arrange and design shrubberies are under considerable economic stress at this point in time. Did you say shrubberies? Yes. Shrubberies are my trade. I'm a shrubber. My name is Roger the Shrubber. I arrange, design, and sell shrubberies. But either rather aggressively to Roger. Nee! No, no, no! This is Arthur. 26 exterior glade dusk. Cut to the glade in the forest again. Oh, Knights of Nia! Here is your shrubbery! May we go now? This is a good shrubbery! I like the laurels particularly, but there is one small problem. What is that? We are now no longer the lights who say me, me, shh, sorry. We are now the knights who go, meow, won't ping, me, me, ping, me, shh, shh. Therefore, we are no longer contractually bound by an agreement previously entered into the knights by saying me, me, ping, shh, shut up. To Arthur, he says. Therefore, we must give you a test. A test to satisfy the knights who now say, Nyao Wamping. Others, in a terrific chorus, say, Nyao Wamping. Arthur, what is this test, knights of Ni Can't say it. Recently, knights of Ni. Dude, it's, it literally it says knights of N. Oh my god. Ni! Firstly, you must get us another shrubbery. The other knights have seen. More shrubberies, more shrubberies for the next knights of me. Not another shrubbery. When you have found when you have found the shrubbery, place a shrubbery here. Besides this shrubbery, only slightly higher, so you get a two level effect with a path through the middle. A path, a path, a little path for the late knights of me. Courses of me, me go out. When you have found the shrubbery, then you must cut down the mightiest tree in the forest. With a herring? Yes, with a herring! With a herring! Cut down with a herring! We shall do no such thing. Let us pass. Oh, please. Cut down a tree with a herring? It can't be done. The other knights, they all recoil in horror. Oh! Don't say that word. What word? I cannot tell you. Suffice to say is one of the words the knights of me cannot hear. How can we say not say the word if you don't tell us what it is? The tall knight, cringing and fear, says, You said it again! Arthur says, What? Is? Dismissively, the tall knight says, No, no, not is! The other knights repeat, saying, Not ease, not ease. Suddenly, singing is heard from deep in the forest. Sir Robin singers, Bravely good, Sir Knight. Robin was not at all afraid. 
The hammer is I, boss Goodwin. The tall knight airily says, "Is is all right. You want to get far, not saying is." But Eva says, "My liege, it's Sir Robin." A tall knight covering his ears. You said the word again. Sir Robin and his singers appearing in the clearing. The singers are going on cheerfully as usual, and Robin walks in front of them, continuously embarrassed at their presence. And his kidney burst and his nipple skin went off. Robin holds his hand up for silence. Sir Robin! He shakes his hand warmly. My liege, it's good to have found you again. Now he said the word! Where are you going, good Sir Robin? Robin singers, starting up again their lovely chorus. He was going home, he was giving up, he was sewing in the sponge. Robin, to his singers, says, Shut up! No! Er, no, I, er, I, I certainly wasn't giving up. I was actually looking for the grail uh, thing in this forest. No, it lies beyond the forest. Stop saying that word! Stop saying the words! Stop saying the words! The words we cannot hear! The word! Arthur, losing his patience with the fearful knights of knee. Oh, stop it! Terrific confusion amongst the knights of knee. They roll on the ground, covering their ears. The tall knight remains standing, trying to control his men. The other knights, they're all saying the word! Tall knight, stop saying it! Arg! I said it! The other knights, you said it! Arg! We've said it! We're all saying it! Arthur beckons to Bedivere and Robin, and they pick their way through the helpless knights of knee and away into the forest. 27 Exterior Historian's Glade Day. We cut to an almost subliminal shot of the historian's wife being shown into a police car, which then roars off on, out of the glade. Cut back to the forest, the Knights of Knee are slowly recovering. They get up. Well, at least we've got one shrubbery. Yes, yes, we've done very well. Knee! She, I think someone's coming. We'll get them to give us another shrubbery. Good idea! More shrubberies, as many as possible. Perhaps we start to track back from the scene as they go on talking. What shall we call ourselves this time? How about the Knights of Nicky Neck? 28th Exterior Day. A small group of peasants are being shuffled into a group formation at the apparent description of someone behind the camera. A few coughs as they shuffle together. A moment of silence. Then they burst into pleasant... Mellifluous, mellifluous song. When dude, when the trees you bless them full and the hills are green, oh, oh, we sing, hey, hey, we sing, our country song. A hail of arrows hit them and they crumple off. Sounds of raucous laughter off camera. Cut to reveal a firing squad of archers kneeling not ten feet away from the group of singers. Sitting on the throne on a dais is King Brian the Wild. He is roaring with laughter, and his court is slightly shabby, bearing all the marks of a faded richness. It is a court without women, and nobody does the washing or shaves very well. Perhaps there's a washing, however, on the lines over the castle. King Brian's advisors stand around him. Everyone bears a sign of past injuries, except for Brian himself i.e. they have an arm and a sling or head bandaged. All the people at the court, except for Brian, have their left arm missing, possibly the result of some violent edict a few years back. <laughs> oh, very good! Next! The first advisor, a little uncomfortably, perhaps his arm is in a sling, obviously giving him some more pain. There are no more, sir. Grabbing him by the collar, King Brian shouts, What do you mean, you filthy dog? The first advisor, There are no more close harmony groups in the kingdom, sir. No more close harmony groups! We have scoured the kingdom. 
King Brian, lifting him bodily into the air and breaking his arm again slightly. You miserable worm! You wretch! You walking son of a doogie keeper! Guards! Two rather shabby looking guards approach. As everyone else, they also have their left arms missing. First advisor says, Have mercy, your majesty! Guards! Take him away and suspend him by his nostrils from the highest tree in the kingdom! The guards grab him unmercifully and drag him off. He whines piteously. 29. Exterior. Day. Cut back to the glade where the Knights of Nee were. A police car roars up. Two plainclothes detectives and a constable get out. Look around suspiciously, perhaps kneel and examine the ground. One policeman finds Patsy's shoe, and the other finds a strange scientific instrument that was hanging from Bediver. They nod grimly to each other, climb back in the car, and drive off. 30. Exterior Day Back in King Brian's court, the first advisor has been dragged off. There are muffled screams coming from the nearby tree. The first advisor is being hauled up on its pulleys. Your Majesty, I can find you a lute player whose music is passing sweet. It's not the same, you thick-headed fool! King Brian hits him on the back of the head. He falls. There is no fun in killing soloists! The second advisor, while picking himself up, he may have a friend? Guards! Oh, please, Your Majesty, please! Take him away and tie his kidneys to the longest hedge in the kingdom! The guards drag the advisor roughly away. No! He is dragged off, screaming and protesting. King Brian roaring at the rest of the court. I will personally disembowel the next little bastard who tells me there are no more close harmony! At this moment, we hear faintly the sound of singing. King Brian stopped to listen. The entire court turns thankfully towards the Malefius sound. Where the knights of the round table our shows are formidable, but many times we're given rhymes that are quite unsingable. Wait a minute! Five point harmony with a counter tenor lead! Various members of the court sigh and breathe more easily. Thank goodness. Shut up! Punches him right on the end of the nose and shouts to the second advisor, Oi! You! The second advisor, who's doubled up, surrounded by soldiers busy with his stomach. Yes, your majesty. Go and get him! The second advisor gratefully says, Thank you, sir. And he staggers off with some difficulty. The guard goes, Man, we just started taking his kidneys out. Cut to Arthur, Bediever, Galahad, and Lancelot. Garwin, Thram, Haircrot, plus all their pages. They, they are riding along, singing cheerfully. Well, baby man, the Camelot, we nurse and push the fram a lot. And while we're tough and able, quite an defective able. Between our guests, we seek to invest in dress like a petty gable. It's safe. The second advisor says, Halt! Sir Galahad goes, Who are you to dare halt the knight of King Arthur's round table in mid verse? The second advisor, I bring greetings from the court of King Brian. King Brian the Wild? Some call him that, but he's calmed down a lot recently. Are those your kidneys? The second advisor, now covering his stomach, says, No, no, it's nothing, just a flesh wound. The knights look at each other. He has heard your beautiful melody and wishes you to come to his court. There he might listen to you at his ease. Ooh. You must be joking. General murmur of agreement from the other knights. Go to the court of the King Brian the Wild and sing close harmony. Other knights, no fear, etc. Second advisor, an increasing pain. It need not be close harmony. <laughs> Sir, ah, but it would be land to close harmony, wouldn't it? Not necessarily. As I say, King Brian is much more relaxed than he used to be. I mean, could we just stick to one line of plain song with a bit of straight choral work? 
Well, obviously, he'd prefer a bit of close harmony. Ah, there you are. We'd end unlike the shell. We'd end unlike the Shallot Coral Society. Oh, that was an accident. Honestly, he's so calm now. Uh oh, no, we must be on our way. They start off. By now, the second advisor is lying on the ground at his last gasp, but still trying to sound threatening. If you don't come and sing for him, uh, he'll drive uh, iron spikes through your heads. Ah, that sounds more like Brian the Wild. <coughs> Sorry. These voices, man. In my head. The second advisor now looking helplessly at his intestines. E e still gets irritable occasionally. Like with close harmony groups. Ugh, look, if you're scared. We're not scared. With his last ounce of strength, the second advisor says, Very well, King Brian challenges you to sing before him in close harmony. A challenge, says Arthur. The knights look at each other, rather than taken aback, but an idealistic glow suffuses King Arthur's eyes. As he looks heavenwards, the other knights look at him rather fearfully. In a majestic tone, Arthur goes, It is a challenge! We cannot refuse! So got our half. Wisely says. King Brian's a fucking loony. The second advisor goes, Great! And dies. Are you alright? Cut to King Brian the Wild on his Diaz. He sees the knights enter the arena. Ah, good! Cut to trumpeters who executes a rather bad fanfare full of missed notes. Meanwhile, various shots of preparation. King Brian settling down. Knights being led up to the podium. The last of the previous close harmony group is being loaded onto a cart and pushed away by the cart driver from scene uh, two. Perhaps we see him being paid off. Shot of King Brian on his podium and the herald being untied and having his gag removed. Shot of Arthur and the knights getting into a group on the podium, still rather nervous. The fanfare comes to an end in several wrong notes. The king who cannot wait. Right! Carry on, gentlemen! King Brian says carry on, says the herald. In a whispering tone. All right, two tenor lines. I'll take the bass. They all nod. One, two, three. Sounds of bows are being drawn very nearby. Arthur looks up and frowns. Cut to reveal a line of 20 archers that all have their le le left leg missing, but they do have two arms. Their arrows are drawn back and point directly at Arthur and co. Hold it! Uh, King Brian! The herald louder than ever. Arthur of Camelot addresses the almighty King Brian! Truly. What? What are... <clears throat> what are they for? Indicating at the archers. Them? Them! Just to show you where the audience would be. Well, we prefer to do it without an audience. Oh, you've got to have an audience! King Brian the Wise and good ruler of this land says you've got to have an audience. We'd rather give a private recital. They said they'd give a private recital. Oh, wise, good, and just King Brian, and not the least bit wild. <sighs> to himself. King Brian says, Tez. He nods to the archers, who turn and hop smartly off and step. Left. 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 They hop around behind a long fence and disappear from sight. Fence needs to be about seven or nine feet high. Right! Ready when you are. King Brian is ready. And a one, two, three, four. They are just about to sing when the archers, bows ready and arrow points, peep over the top of the fence. Hold it! Where? Quick flashes of arrows sense the fire. One tires to hold his shot back, but fails and fires his arrows by accident into the air. 
quick flash of first advisor who was hanging by his nostrils on the high screen of the kingdom, moaning, getting hit by the arrow. What is it now? We're not entirely happy with the acoustics. They're not entirely happy with... Impatiently, King Brian yells. Oh, Sunday acoustics! Get on with the singing! King Brian says, saw the acoustics. In that case, we shall just have to perform elsewhere. Turns to his eyes and begins to show them off. They say in case that they shall have to perform, perform elsewhere, a rich, famous, and extremely calm king. Getting very angry. Dripping, dribbling slightly. No! You've got to sing the, the target, uh, convert, uh, thing! King Brian has stumbled over his words. What a wonderfully human incident. Don't editorialize. Sorry, King. Come on, you bastards. Sing close harmony. King Brian snaps his fingers and the archers rise above the fence without any pretense of concealment, fitting arrows into their bows. King Brian calls them bastards and demands to head close harmony. What will happen next? I said don't! Sorry, King. Alright, I'll like out of three. One! The King said one! Two! The King said two, they have only got one left! We hear the sound of bows being drawn back, tension mounts, the knights all look pretty grim, the end is clearly pretty near. In a face of proximal bloodlust. Three! Sound of the distance of beautiful close harmony singing. Bravely good Sir Robin was not at all afraid. Cut to see Sir Robin and his minstrels approaching from round a corner of the castle. Sir Robin walks a few feet in front of them looking rather embarrassed. Turning the sound says, Fantastic! Cut back to Robin's minstrels. To have his eyeball skewered and his kidneys. Ah! They are suddenly pincushioned with arrows <laughs> oh bloody marvelous robin turns and looks at the decimated remains of his minstrels surprised but relieved so robin this way arthur leads his men off the platform and they are joined by their pages and make good their escape <laughs> king brian shot the wrong group shut up he swings a sword and slices the herald's head off. Herald's head, as it rolls away. Press freedom infringed! 28 exterior, beyond forest, day, animation. Shots of Arthur, etc. riding out of the forest. They leave the forest and they meet Lancelot and Galahad. And so Arthur and Bedeaver and Sir Robin set out on their search to find the enchanter. Sorry of whom the old man had spoken in the scene 24. Beyond the forest, they met Lancelot and Galahad. Sorry. And, they, and there was much rejoicing. 29, exterior. Another landscape. Day, animation. In the frozen lands of Nador, they were forced to eat Robin's minstrels, and there was much rejoicing. A year passed. But Robin's... Right. I said something won't be cut. Montage of shots of the knights. Autumn changed into winter, winter changed into spring, spring changed back into autumn, and autumn gave winter and spring a miss and went straight on into summer. Until one day. 30 exterior wastes day. The knights are riding along the top of a ridge. The country is wild and inhospitable. Suddenly, some of them see fire in the distance and ride towards it. Sounds a lot like England. As they approach, they see an impressive wizard figure striding around conjuring up fire from the ground and causing various bushes and branches to burst into flame. What manner of man are you that can conjure up fire without flint or tinder? I am an enchanter. Arthur looks at the diver. By what name are you now? There are some who call me Tim. Greetings, Tim the Enchanter. Greetings, King Arthur. You know my name. I do, as he does another fire trick. You see the Holy Grail. 
That is our quest. You know, much that is hidden, no, Tim. Tim does another fire trick. Quiet. Ripples of applause <clears throat> from the knights. Sorry. Yes, we seek the Holy Grail. Clears throats very quickly. <clears throat> our quest is to find the Holy Grail. One or two knights go. Yes, it is. And so we're looking for it. Yes, we are. We have been for some time. Yes. Months. Yes. And obviously, any help we can get is very helpful. Do you know where it is? Tim does another fire tricks. Oh, the knights go, shh. Fine. Well, uh, we mustn't take up any more of your time. I don't suppose. Sorry to keep you off about it. You haven't by any chance uh, any idea where one might find a... Uh, what? A... G g a grail? They all jump slightly and look about apprehensively. Uh, yes, I think so. Yes. Yes. Fine. Splendid. Yes, marvelous. Tim looks thoughtful, and they all stand around a little. Then Tim produces another fire trick producing several different colors. Look, you're a busy man. Yes, I can help you with your quest. Slight pause. All the knights go. Thank you, yes, thank you very much. To the north there lies a cave, the cave of Garabog, wherein carved in mystic runes upon the very living rock, the last words of Ulfin, Bedware of Regan. There is a thunderclap and a wind starts. The knights get nervous. Make plain the last resting place of the most holy grail. How shall we find this cave, O Tim? Follow. The knights register delight and wheel round on themselves. But only if you are men of valor. For the entrance to this cave is guarded by a monster. A creature so foul and cruel that no man yet has fought it and lived. Bones of full fifty men lie strewn about its lair. Therefore, sweet knights, if you may doubt your strength or courage, come no further, for death awaits you all with nasty pointy teeth. What an eccentric performance. 31. Exterior. Day. Whew. Cut to impressive rock face with caves in it. The knights are riding towards it. A foreboding atmosphere superiors. Tim gives a signal for quietness. Arthur shushes the horses. The pages decrease the amount of noise, but they are making with the coconuts for a few seconds. Then there is a burst of noise from them, including whining. Whining? Whining? Bedeaver to Arthur says, They're nervous, sire. Then we best leave them here and carry on foot. Tim takes a strange look at them. They walk on leaving the pages behind. After a few more strides, Tim holds them with a sign. Behold the cave of Carabog. Or Carbon... Carbonog. Carbonog. Cut to the shot of a cave. Bones littering around. The knights get the wind up partially. A little dry ice. Glowing green can be seen at the entrance. Suddenly we become aware of total silence. Any noises the knights make sounds very exaggerated. They unsheathe their swords. Keep me covered. There's a stirring among the knights. With what? Just keep me covered. Too late. What? There he is. They all turn and see a large white rabbit loll up a few yards out of the cave, accompanied by terrifying chord and sharring metallic monster noise. Where? There. Behind the rabbit? It is the rabbit. You silly sod. What? You got us all worked up. You cretin. This, that, is not an ordinary rabbit. Tis the most foul, cruel, and bad tempered thing you have ever set your eyes on. You tit. I soiled my armor, I was so scared. Now the rabbit's got a vicious streak. It's a killer. Oh, fuck off. Get stuffed. It'll do you up a great treat, mate. Oh, yeah. You turn. Maggie Scott's git. Look, I'm warning you. What's he do? Nibble your bum? Well, it's got huge, very sharp. It can jump up. Look at the bones. 
Go on, boys. Chop a head off. Right, silly little bleeder. One rabbit stew coming up. Look! As Tim points, they all spin round to see the rabbit leap at Boris' throat with a appalling scream. From a distance of about 20 feet, there's a tin opening sound. A cry from Boris. A quick close-up of a savage rabbit biting through tin, and Boris' head flies off. The rabbit leaps back into the mouth of the cave and sits there looking in the night's direction and growling menacingly. Jesus Christ! I warned you! I've done it again, says Robin. Did I tell you? Did you listen to me? Oh, no, no, you knew better than you. No, it's just an ordinary rabbit, isn't it? The names you called me, well, don't say I didn't tell you. Oh, shut up. Quietly, Tim says. It's always the same. If I said it once... Charge! Says Arthur. They all charge with swords drawn toward the rabbit. A tremendous 20 second fight with peck and pash shots and borrowing heavenly also on the kung fu and karate type films ensues in, what, in which some four knights are comprehensively killed. Run away! Run away! All knights taking up cry. Run away! Run away! They run down from the cave and hide, regrouping behind some rocks. Tim, some way away, is pointing on them at laughing derisively. Who did we lose? Sir Guy won. Hector. And Boars. Five. Three, sir, says Galahad. Three. Well, why not risk another frontal assault? That rabbit's dynamite. Would it help to confuse him if we run away more? Shut up. Go change your armor. Robin leaves, walking strangely. Guess he shit himself. Galahad says. Let us taunt it. It may become so cross that it will help make a mistake. Like what? Galahad cannot find a suitable answer to that. Do we have any bones? Do we have any bows? I should be doing a British accent. Oh, a Scottish accent. A Scottish accent for Galahad. You know, it fits right now. No. We uh, have the holy hand grenade, says Lancelot. The what? The holy hand grenade of Antioch. Tis one of the sacred relics Brother Maynard always carries with him. Yes, of course, all of them say. Shouting after says, Bring up the holy hand grenade! <laughs> a slight pause. Then, from the area where the horses are, a small group of monks process follow or er, uh, forward towards the knights, the leading monk bearing an ornate golden reliquary, and the accompanying monks chanting and waving incense. They reach the knights. The hand grenade is suffused with the holy glow. Arthur takes it. Pause. How does... Uh... I know not, says Lancelot. Consult the Book of Armaments. Brother Maynard. Armaments, chapter 2, verse 9 to 21. Reading from the Bible. And Saint Attila raised his hand grenade up on high, saying, O Lord, bless this thy hand grenade, that with it thou mayst blow thine enemies to tiny bits in thy mercy. And the Lord did grin, and people did feast upon the lambs, and sloths, and carp, and anchovies, and orangutans, and breakfast cereals, and fruit bats, and... Skip, skip a bit, brother. Uh, oh, yes. And the Lord spake, saying, First shalt thou take out the holy pin, then shalt thou count to three, no more, no less. Three shalt be the number thou shalt count, and the number of the counting shalt be three. Four shalt thou not count, neither count thou two, excepting thou then proceed to three. Five is right out. Once the number three, being the third number, be reached, then lovest thou thy holy hand grenade of Antioch. Towards thou foe, who being naughty in my sight, shall snuff it. Right. He pulls the pin out. The monk blesses the grenade as... Quietly. One, two, three, five... Three, sir! Three! Arthur throws the grenade at the rabbit. There is an explosion and cheering from the knights. Praise be to the Lord! Huzzah! 32. Interior, cave, day. Mixed through to the knights entering the cave. 
It is a large cave, and as they walk inside it, we see in the darkness at the side of the cave a fearsome-looking creature, which watches them with some surprise as they walk to some writing carved on the back of the cave wall. The knights are accompanied by Brother Maynard. There! Look! What does it say? What language is this? Brother Maynard, you are a scholar. It is Aramaic. Of course, Joseph Aramitha. Aramitha. Of course. What does it say? It reads, Here may be found the last words of Joseph Ar Aramitha. Excitement. He who was valorous and pure of heart may find the Holy Grail in the... Ar what? The... Ar What's that? He must have died while carving it. Oh, come on. That's what it says. Arthur miming. But he, if he was, but if he was dying, he wouldn't bother the carving. He'd just say it. It's down there, carved in stone. Perhaps he was dictating. Shut up! Is that all it says? That's all. Do you think he meant the carom leg? Where's that? France, I think. Isn't there a Saint Arg in Cornwall? No, no, that's Saint Ives. A muffled roar is heard. Hey! No, that's in Her Herefordshire. More usually. No, hey! Arg! No, hey! Is surprise and alarm. Oh! No, arg! At the back of the throat. No, ooh, surprise and alarm. He indicated the entrance of the cave. They all turned and look. There in the opening is a huge, unpleasant, fairly well-drawn cartoon beast. Oh, my God. What is it? I know, I know, I know. What? It's the... Oh. Snaps his fingers and tries to remember. It's the... Uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Another hideous roar. That's it. What? It's the legendary black beast of... Arr! At that moment, there's a yell and a scream out of vision. Arthur turns. Who was that? Hector, from the back of the group. Northern and Helper. It was Sir Alf. I didn't know we had a Sir Alf. He was feeding it bread. Arthur, shouting back. Well, that was a very silly thing to do. Now the rest of you stand well back from the Black Beast. Arr! Arr! Look out! The animation monster starts lumbering towards them. The knights retreat into the darkness of the cave. Skywin, as they run. It's only a cartoon. Shh! They run off. Darkness. The monster lumbering through an animation. As the horrendous black beast lunge forward, escape for Arthur and his knights seem hopeless. When suddenly, the animator suffered a fatal heart attack. Ah! The cartoon peril was no more. The quest for Holy Grail could continue. And an animated sequence leads through to the group reappearing and seeing a distant opening to the cave. They reach the opening. It is day. 33. Exterior. Day. Good lord, two hours. Alright. The knights emerge from the mouth of the cave to find themselves in a breathtaking barren landscape. Glencoe. They are halfway... They are... They're halfway their way up the side of a mountain. They rest a few seconds and get their breath back. Look! There it is! The Bridge of Death! Oh, great, says Robin to himself. They look and see on the side of the mountain there's a sort of milestone which bears the word Arrgh! Five miles and an arrow. God be praised! This must be the gorge of which the old man spoke in scene 24. The knight set off along and rather perilous track edging along the side of the mountain. Galahad is leading. Mixed through, they are climbing higher. The path gets more and more slippery and dangerous. They reach another milestone, which says, Arr! Four miles in an hour, in an arrow. And knee! 82 miles in an arrow pointing in the opposite direction. They go on. It is dangerous and difficult. Tension in their faces. As they're climbing, Bedivere turns to Robin and Arthur. We must find the bridge. The bridge of death. Robin to himself says, Oh, great. But if you're going on, The bridge is guarded by a bridge keeper who asks each traveler three questions and he who answers the three questions can cross in safety. Larry Robin says, 
And did you get a question wrong? You are cast into the gorge of eternal peril. 34. Exterior day. Cut to them struggling along, perhaps downhill now. It is growing misty. St. Lancelot stops them in points. They peer. Cut to see in the mist. A weird bridge with mist swirling up from the gorge below. You cannot see the other side. Beside the bridge, an old man stands. He is the blind soothsayer they met earlier in the forest. To Bedivere, Arthur goes, He's the keeper of the bridge. It's the old man. Swallowing hard, Bedivere says, Who is going to answer the question? You go, Robin, and God be with you. Looking around wildly, uh, I I'll tell you what. Why doesn't Lancelot go? Considering for a moment. Well, Sir Lancelot, brave Sir Lancelot. This is the bridge of death. Oh, yes, sir. I will take it single-handed. Drawing a sword, I will... Arthur restrains him. No, hang on. All we want is for you to approach the old man, and he'll ask you three questions. Answer those questions as best you can, and we will watch and pray. Yes, my liege. Good luck, brave Sir Lancelot. Be careful. They shake hands. Arthur eyes moisten. Lancelot approaches the bridge of death. Listen to the questions. Look, it's the old man from Team 24. What's he doing here? He's the keeper of the bridge. He asks each traveler five questions. Three questions. Three questions. He who answers the five questions. Three questions. Three questions may cross in safety. Where the Rama goes. And if you get a question wrong, you're cast into the gorge of eternal peril. Oh, a cow. A cow? Watch him. Who's going to answer the questions? Wait, this is just, this is just, I, I just read this. Okay, I read this, and it just repeats it. Lancelot says, and what, perhaps I may always go back to the I'll be with you. Lancelot approaches the bridge keeper. Stop. Sir Lancelot stops. The knights watch anxiously. Arthur sniffs briefly and glances momentarily down at Sir Robin's lower armor. Who approaches the bridge of death? Must answer me. Three, these questions, three. Ere the other side, he, she. Ask me the questions, bridgekeeper. I am not afraid. What is your name? My name is Sir Lancelot. What is your quest? To find the Holy Grail. What is your favorite color? Blue. White. Off you go. Sir Lancelot runs across into the mist. The bridge, perhaps, disappears into the mist, and we cannot see the other side. Arthur and Sir Robin exchange glances. Robin breathes a great sigh of relief. That's easy! Stop! Who approaches the bridge of death must answer me these questions three. Ere the other side, he, she. Ask me the questions, bridgekeeper. I am not afraid. What is your name? My name is Sir Robin of Camelot. What is your quest? To seek the Grail. What is the capital of Assyria? I don't know that. He is immediately hurled by some unseen force over the edge of the precipice. Ah! 35 exterior day. Cut to Sir Lancelot, who is only just arriving on the other side. He looks back across the invisible chasm. Dimly in the distance, he hears, Sir Guy went up Camelot. What is your quest? To seek the Holy Grail. What goes black, white, black, white, black, white? Oh, uh, Babylon. Uh, ah! Sir Lancelot stands on the other side of the bridge. In the distance, we hear the ritual questions and a scream and thud. Suddenly, a hand lays on Lancelot's shoulder. A policeman. Just want to ask you some questions, sir. Lancelot turns and reacts. He's led away. 36 Exterior Lake Day. Cut to Arthur, Galahad, and Bedivere struggling towards the lake. Uh. What? I'm seeing something, right? To Arthur, how did you know how many wings beats a swallow needs to maintain velocity? Oh, when you're king, you know all these things. Wait, no, that's after. What the hell? The script is wrong. Bridgekeeper. What is your favorite color? Blue. No, yellow. 
Arthur and Bedivere step forward. What is your name? It is I, Arthur, King of the Britons. What is your quest to seek the Holy Grail? What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? What do you mean? An African or a European swallow? Er, I don't know that. Arrgh! The bridge keeper is cast into the gorge. But Evier asks, how do you know so much about swallows? Well, you have to know these things when you're king, you know. Suddenly, they appear at a water's edge. They look across the water, a huge expanse disappearing in the mist. Wait, dude, this is all wrong. Wait, no. I'm oh, sorry. Suddenly, they appear at the water's edge. Look across the water, a huge expanse disappearing into the mist. How can they cross? Suddenly, the air is filled with ethereal music, and out of the mist appears a wonderful barge, silently and slowly drifting towards them. They gaze in wonder. The mysterious boat comes to where they are standing. As if bewitched, they find themselves drawing closer to the boat. As they rise to step in, a ragged figure looks upon them. The boatkeeper, he is the same as the bridgekeeper and the soothsayer. Who would cross the sea of fate? Must answer me these questions, 28. He fixes them with a baleful eye. Arthur and Bedivere exchange glasses, glances, then turn, with their minds made up, pick him up old bodily and throw him into the water they climb into the boat and the boat moves off into the mist fade out 37 animation a wondrous journey in animation carries them across the lake next to 38 exterior day the boat carries them across a magical lake they land to get out of their boat their faces suffused with heavenly radiance and fall to their knees Cushren Cush Cush crescendo yeah crescendo on music God be praised! The deaths of many fine knights have this day been avenged. The music swells. They have bent their heads in prayer before the castle for which they have searched for so long. Suddenly a voice comes from the battlements. The music comes in. Ha <laughs> ha! Hello! Smelly English can... Maybe... Bruh. And Monsieur Arthur King, who is the brain of a duck, you know. The knights look up. We find for sounds, I will wait you a second time. Perfidious English, my shipping order is how you say, Baroga. Arthur stands up. How dare you profane this place with your presence. I command you, in the name of the Knights of the Camelot, open the door of the sacred castle to which God himself has guided us. He turns to the knights. Come. Arthur and the knights advance from the castle. How you English say, I one my time, Mac. I unclog my nose to you, sons of a window to tear, so you may cut... Old clever as friend fellows with your silly knees been creeping about your venting behavior. Uh, I will not put apart at you, aunties, your bloody cover, mealy tempered, clam beer base smelling, electric donkey, bottom by tears. By this time, Arthur and Bedeaver and Galahad have reached the door. Arthur bangs on the door. In the name of the Lord, we demand entrance to this sacred castle. Jeering from the battlements. No chance, English benefiting types. We burst our pimples at you and call you door opening request a silly thing. You tiny brain weapons of other people's bottoms. French laughter. If you do not open these doors, we will take this castle by force. A bucket of slop lands on Arthur. He tries to regain his dignity. In the name of God and the glory of our Another bucket of what can only be described as human or doer hits Arthur. Right! To the knights. That settles it! They turn and walk away, French cheering full of them. Yes, they put on us at this time, and cut the approaching anymore. Oh, we fire our arrows into the top of your heads and make castanets of your testicles already. To the knights, Arthur goes, walk away, just ignore them. Arthur, Bedivere, and Galahad walk off. A small hail of chickens, watercress, badgers, and mattresses follow. But they are on their dignity as they try to talk nonchalantly as they walk away into the trees. And now let me go! Illegitimate the face, bugger folk! And if you think you got a nasty time this taunting, you ain't had nothing yet! Dappy, can't. Uh, that's a word. And a king is square! Cut back to the drenched bridge keeper, soothsayer, beside the lake, he rises up into the shot. He would cross the saint of sheer fate. Must answer me this question, this 28. Cut to see is talking to two plainclothes policemen and two constables. Alright, put them in the van.
says the inspector. The bridge keeper led away in into police van. Cut back to Arthur, still walking away. French taunts are still audible in the distance. You couldn't clap. Catch clap in that brothel. Single silly English K. And that's a word I'm not saying. To Bediva, Arthur says, We shall attack at once. Yes, my liege. He turns. Stand by for attack. Cut to an enormous army forming up. Trebuchets, rows of pikemen, siege towers, pennants flying, shouts of stand by for attack. Traditional army build-up shouts. The shouts echo across the ranks of the army. We see various groups reacting and stirring themselves in readiness. Who are they? Oh, just some friends, says Bediver. We end up back with Arthur. He seems satisfied that the army is ready. Panning down the serried ranks, pikes ruddy, pennants flapping in the wind, some of the horses whining nervously and rattle their coconuts. Arthur is satisfied at last. He addresses the castle. French persons, today the blood of many valiant knights shall be avenged. In the name of God, we shall not stop our fight until each one of you lies dead and the grail returns to them who as God has chosen. Arthur lowers his visor. Turns to have a last look at his army, then charge! The mighty army charges. Thundering noise of feet, clatter of coconuts, shouts, etc. They charge towards the castle. Suddenly, there is a wail of siren, and a couple of police cars roar round in front of the charging army, and the police leap out and stop them. Two policemen and the historian's wife. Black Maria's skid up behind them. The army halts. The historian's wife says, they're the ones, I'm sure of it. Inspector says, grab him. The police grab Arthur and bundle him into the Maria. Sir Bedivere is let off with a blanket over his head. They are bundled into Black Maria and the van drives off. The rest of the army stands around looking at a loss. Inspector, picking up the megaphone. All right, clear off, go on. A few reaction shots of the army, not quite sure what to do. They'll move along, there's nothing to see, keep moving. Suddenly... He notices the camera. As the Black Maria drives away, quick shot through window of all the knights huddled inside. To the camera, the instructor says, All right, put that away, Sonny. He walks over to it and puts his hand over the lens. The film runs out through the gate and the projector shines on the screen. There is a Blake's screen for some 15 seconds. Suddenly, jazzy music, animated titles, a new film completely free with the Monty, Monty Python films. The credits. Four or five minute film, mainly animated about the credits, i.e. It includes the actual credits for the film, but it's really elaborate. The end. Slushy organ music starts, and the house lights in the cinema come on. Organ music continues as the audience leaves. <laughs>